Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we can, of course, continue on Daniel chapter 11, uh, writing out the line of Rome. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study here this morning. And so we invite your spirit uh, to instruct us. Uh, we know, Lord, that there's many things we don't understand and we need your enlightenment. We also pray for one another, and for the trials that we face, that you can give us strength. And we ask, Lord, that the truths that you show to us can help us in our daily lives and help all who are searching for truth to have confidence and faith in you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I was just having a bit of trouble with one of my computers there, so I had to restart it. And, um, yeah, I have to bring up uh, this other file as well. So when we had uh, – I'm just going to go back here a little bit of review, I guess I might call it, um, just over the last little bit. And – I have to open this up. Okay, I'll come back to that. So we had, uh, I'm just going to go back here a little bit. Now, when we had finished off uh, Greece, we had um, taken the six Syrian wars and um, we had lined them up with our history. We had the third angel arriving April 5th, 2030. And that was uh, some very interesting structures. And we're going to find that this line of Rome is going to be similar, but there are differences. And and that's where, you know, each of these lines repeats and it, it covers the same history. But, of course, Greece is addressing Greece, right? That is, it's addressing the dragon power, where Rome is addressing uh, the papal power. And. And also uh, does represent to some degree the United States as well. So, so when we started drawing out this line, it starts out very much the same. We have the Soviet Afghan war, just as we did with Greece. And, uh, yet there are details in here because it's, it's the beginning of this line, right? That is, we're comparing here the Soviet Afghan war, uh, with the, the fifth Syrian war. So that is, our line isn't much different, but the line of Rome is a different history illustrating our line. And so we talked a little bit about what does the the, the period of darkness uh, refer to? How do we address that um, in in this line? So I'm going to bring up the charts here, the diagrams. Okay, let's share this. So, so what we see here is what we had drawn out yesterday and the day before. We have the fifth Syrian war. That's going to parallel the Soviet Afghan war. That's the period of darkness. And, um, here we have Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. We have the verses underneath. So we can see that Panium or Panium is represented in 11 verse 15. And then we have the battle of Thermopylae. That's the center of the 62 weeks where Rome, in a sense, we call this the formalization. So Rome has exalted itself. And in this history, uh, shortly after the Battle of Panium, about 10 years or whatever, we're going to have this Battle of Thermopylae where Rome defeats Greece in this battle. And then the next verse is going to address uh, the siege of Jerusalem by Pompey in 63 BC. And then we could see that the second angel's message is going to be represented by what's in Daniel chapter 11. That is, it's going to be Julius Caesar. It's going to be Augustus and Tiberius. And then ultimately it's going to be Titus. So it's not going to address all of those uh, emperors in between. And Titus in technical, it's not the emperor yet. It's um, the other guy. Starts with a V. Um, <clears throat> so but he's just the general at that time. But he, he is going to end up being an emperor after that. So this is the history that Daniel chapter 11 shows us. And 
what we talked about yesterday, whether I expressed myself very well or not, um, that it is that there was, oops, hang on. there was, um, for me, an understanding then about Daniel chapter 11, the purposes of it. That is, when we looked at these lines in the past, at least what I did, you know, you're just trying to match up the, the verses with history. But the question is, why are some historical events chosen over others? And the reason has to do with the lines themselves. That is what God is revealing or unveiling. Um, now we know that Daniel chapter 11 is really an expansion of Daniel chapter 2, you know, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 7, right? All of these, these kingdoms. Uh, but it, of course, it's going to start with Daniel chapter 11 starts with the fall of Babylon and uh, the beginning of Persia. So we know that it's, it's going to mark uh, that history that parallels uh, 1798 and uh, 1989, right? So, so this is what we understand about Daniel chapter 11. And the purposes of these lines, the purposes of the events in each of these lines, so with Rome, because Rome has exalted itself to establish the vision, it's exalted itself, but itself is not doing that to establish the vision. That is, that's in God's providence because Rome needs to be there for the crucifixion of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, right? So that's what this line is going to address. The problem is going to be when we start looking at uh, this line in our history, specifically, what would that be? And, um, you know, I haven't, we, we've looked at some of it, but we hadn't completed Rome. That is, we hadn't given the present truth application for many of these verses. And, and that's what we're going to have to do. And there is a, another line in there as well for Rome. So Rome's going to have more than one line. So that's going to be interesting once we, we get this sorted out. So with the, the verses that we looked at that got Augustus, Tiberius, and Titus, let's look at these verses again. So just kind of review what we had done yesterday. So when we get to in verse 17 and 18, that's going to cover Julius Caesar, and that's going to be pretty clear, right? So when you get 16, is going to cover um, the formalization of the first message and the empowerment of the message. When you get to 17, that's going to address um, Julius Caesar. So he, pagan Rome under Julius Caesar. Oh, you got to see what I'm doing here, so I can share that screen. So Julius Caesar sets his face to enter Egypt, right, with the strength of his whole kingdom and the upright ones with him. And uh, we say that the upright ones represent the Jews. And those are the Jewish forces loyal to Caesar, led by Antipater. And, and those are going to, in our history, represent the Protestants in spiritual formation. So we can see how that's going to address 9-11. Thus shall he do... Um, talking about what God is going to do in his providence. And um, and God is then going to give to Caesar the daughter of women. And since this is Cleopatra in that history, we say that this is the world, the UN, the dragon power, whatever we want to call it. And this is going to happen in this history that's being described. So, you know, we're going to see that that's going to be at 9-11. Or we could say it's at 11.9, depends how we, we look at it. Um, but she shall not stand neither for him. After after this, shall he turn his, he's going to turn his face toward the isles, unto the isles. Right? So, so he's going to turn his face. This is going to refer to the UN. Right? And he shall take many. But a prince, that is Michael, your prince, shall cause the reproach um, to cease. Right? And so we're saying that this is symbolizing July 18, 2020. And this introduces the cross, the third angel's message. And without his own reproach, Christ has no shame of his own. 
he shall cause it to turn upon himself, a reference to the cross. So Christ takes our shame upon, shame upon himself. So this is contrasting Julius Caesar with Christ. Julius Caesar's ambition compared to Christ's condescension. Then Julius Caesar is going to turn his face toward the fort of his own land. That we have this as, as Bush the second, and um, this his own land. This is Rome. This is USA. The armies of Rome. But he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So referring to Caesar's assassination, and then shall stand up in his um, in his estate a raiser of taxes. So we put that as Obama, and uh, in the glory of the kingdom. Uh, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle, right? Um, and in his Augustus's or Obama's estate shall stand up a vile person. Of course, that's going to be Trump. Uh, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably. There's a peaceful transfer, transference of power after Augustus's death. So. And then obtain the kingdom by flatteries, right? So we got Tiberius Caesar um, paralleling Trump, and Trump is uh, just like Tiberius, this false flattery. And then the armies of a flood shall they, the alleged seditionist is what uh, swearing it has, be overflown from before him. So this, some of this stuff we have to kind of figure out uh, what what this means. Um, and how we're going to understand this. But we know this is going to refer to the Prince of the Covenant, the crucifixion of Christ. And, and we put that as July 18th. So this is is mentioned before in this contrast. And then um, we're going to have this, uh, you know, stated as it happens under Tiberius. So it's going to be mentioned earlier in this contrast between Julius Caesar and Christ. And then you're going to have Julius Caesar followed by Obama and then Obama followed by Trump. So there's still a lot of detail that we have to work out in here. And then the other part was uh, we're going to have this league. And so it's going to go back in history to this league, but that's because it's pointing forward to um, the destruction of Jerusalem. Now it's also going to address uh, Rome. Um, it's basically when the capital from Rome moves to Constantinople, and it's also going to address uh, the Edict of Milan, so the 313. So 313 and 330 BC are going to be mentioned here. So we're going to have to be able to, to take what we had done with these verses and put it into this structure. So in some ways, this is a line in and of itself, right? So we're dealing with Rome, but we have these lines. So this is a zoom into. So somehow we have to take this and and place it in our history. And there are different ways that we could do it. So uh, any questions about this so far? No questions quite yet. No. OK, so going back to our diagrams. <clears throat> We can take these verses and we could, you know, put them underneath here, which we're, we're going to have to do. But really the difficulty is understanding these events. Now, one way that we could look at it. So normally what we have the destruction of Jerusalem as uh, the, the third angel's message arriving. Right. And and that would be a close of probation. Wouldn't I mean, we have the stoning of Stephen in there, but it's not specifically mentioned in in this verse. So we don't have specifically the end of the 70 weeks mentioned. We're going to have the crucifixion of Christ under Tiberius. And so we're going to have to try to figure out how we, we place that specifically. But because this is about Rome, what Rome is, is doing, you know, it's going to come and conquer Jerusalem. It's going to like first defeats Greece, then it's going to conquer Jerusalem. And, and then we're going to have these emperors. And um, Julius Caesar is not an emperor, but, you know, Julius Caesar, Augustus and Tiberius being marked Julius Caesar as a contrast to Christ. But a, in Christ comes in the time of Augustus crucified in Tiberius. 
So that's the midst of the week in Daniel chapter 9, where the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So Titus is going to destroy the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary itself. So, I mean, maybe we could say, I mean, we know the stoning of Stephen is a close of probation. But really, it's so is the destruction of Jerusalem. I mean, they're they're connected, right? There's there's the sentence pronounced and then there's its execution. So so this all to, to me, this makes sense. I mean, what we see here in Daniel chapter 11, uh, we can clearly see that this is the history that it's describing. It's not describing a history dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. And then we have to, to understand this below. How are we going to really put this all together? So when it comes to the verses themselves, uh, when it comes to Augustus, we're going to have in verse um, 19, so it's just what, verse 19 and verse 19 is going to be that. Then you have Obama is going to be verse 20 and let me get this straight. So 20 and then verse 21 is Trump. And then under Trump, you're going to have verse 22 as well. And then it's going to be verse uh, 23 and 24 that are going to address the destruction of Jerusalem. This is going to discuss the league. And, and so we have to figure out how we're going to do that. I mean, it, we put there Titus, but this is the league leading to the destruction of Jerusalem. And um, so 23 and 24. Okay. So let's draw that in. I remember what we had. We're just going to have verse 19 here. Now, as a question, yeah. why are you focused on Titus? Well, because it's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. That's why I put him there. So obviously it's going to go all the way through the league up to the destruction of Jerusalem and then the diaspora, right? So okay. it's, but yeah, I'm not focused on Titus. I'm just putting them there as a placeholder. Okay. Titus. Okay, but Titus was Roman emperor from 79 to 81. I know, but he's, he was the general when Jerusalem was destroyed. So okay. he's not. Yeah. Yeah. So right. he's, he's going to be uh, the Roman emperor when Pompey is destroyed as a response to the destruction of Jerusalem. So we had Augustus as 19, right? And then Tiberius as, let's look here again. Oh, no. I did that wrong. So we're going to have 19 is actually still part of. So I don't know why I did it that way. Okay. So 19 is part of Julius Caesar still. And this is going to be verse 20. And this is going to be 21 and 22. And then this third angel arriving is going to be 23 and 24. Right. But it's. It's I mean, also it's, kind of interesting with Titus mm -hmm. because at birth he had three names and then his name was changed in 69 AD. Okay. What was his name originally? Titus Flavius Vespasian. Vespasian? Arrhenius. Okay. Or Anus. And then his... Uh, name was changed to Titus Caesar Vespanius. Okay. Yeah, and Vespasian is the, the emperor when when uh, Jerusalem is destroyed, his uh, his dad. So, but yeah, so I mean, we put Titus there just because it's the destruction of Jerusalem that's symbolized, but it's going to be all about this league, so this Roman league. So I, I don't know. I don't know exactly how this is going to line up with what dates below this, but but we can agree that this is what's being described. So even though it's it's going to go back to the Roman League, that is, we can zoom into this third angel arriving here uh, to give that whole history going. Well, it, it covers a lot of history, right? That is, those verses, verses 23 and 24, are going to go all the way back uh, to 
what is it that we had here? Right. So it's it's going to go back to the Battle of Pharsalus, because uh, the even for a time is the end of that. And so this Battle of Pharsalus and the Battle of Actium are all part of this structure that leads um, here. It's going to lead all the way to the city of Rome moving from or the capital of Rome, moving from the city of Rome to, to Constantinople. Right. So it doesn't particularly when it says even for a time, it's not addressing the destruction of Jerusalem per se, but it's going to talk about that in the verse. So the destruction of Jerusalem and what Rome does ultimately ends to Rome's demise and it happens progressively. So Rome may, you know, destroy Jerusalem, but its end and its beginning are tied together. So this period for Rome, the 360 years that is mentioned here, uh, for the, the fortress, and then also uh, the 360 years leading to the Edict of Milan, leading to the persecution. Um, these become really, really important to understand in, in the context of what happens with the destruction of Jerusalem. Just thinking about this a little bit, oh, we're going to come back to that. Because some of the keys here, because we have this line drawn out when it comes to um, the even for a time in the context of our history. So that means that this history, which has a, a structural chiasm to it in our history, there must be something more is what I'm trying to say. There must be something more about uh, this history of, of Rome, where we're placing the cross in that whole context. Um, I don't know better how to, to describe it, but I, I just think there's something that I'm not seeing. It's like, something on the edge of my vision that I, I haven't, you know, I haven't figured out. So, okay, let me think about this a bit. So when we look at, uh, it's going to be here. So when we look at this history, I mean, we have, uh, you know, 31 BC, the Battle of Actium. And now 31 BC, we're going to have 31 AD for the crucifixion of Christ. Is there any connection then between what we see here with the Battle of Actium and the crucifixion of Christ. Is there, uh, um, we don't have it here on this line, but it's going to be, you know, 61 years after the Battle of Actium. So any thoughts about that? Like, is there something about this structure that connects to the history of Christ to the, se to the 70th week? to the stoning of Stephen and the destruction of Jerusalem. So we don't have those dates in here is what I'm trying to say. They're not, they're not part of this diagram, but they are part of the verses, the verses that give us this diagram. So what, what we can, can we do about this? What can we, remember we have the 343 years, right? Now the 343 represents seven times seven times seven. What else? So it, it represents the cross symbolically, but do we need to put the, the crucifixion of Christ, the stoning of Stephen, and the 70, the 70 AD in this diagram? Is there something about this that, that we're missing? Maybe as we, we address our history, we'll see this more, but we already know that the 433 days and the, and, and the 343 days exist as part of our line. The 125,200 days, uh, which is 313 divided by 400, I know it's probably really tiny. So we have the cross represented here. We have the 70 weeks represented here. Should we maybe just analyze this a bit more is what I'm trying to say by taking somehow. Okay, so if we took, so somewhere in here we'd have the crucifixion of Christ. So we're going to have, I'm going to change this to AD. And that's going to be, okay, so 427, 31 AD. This is going to be the cross. So you got the cross here. Okay, what else? So we would need the destruction of Jerusalem. Now that's going to be 36 years later. So can we relate the 360 to the 36? So that's going to be temple destroyed. 
So, I mean, it's probably not proportionally in the right spot. So the crucifixion of Christ, the midst of the week, and the destruction of Jerusalem. So we have 36 years, and we can say that the 36 years relates to the 360, right? So this is a contrast then between Rome and Christ. Any thoughts about it? Still thinking. Okay. So, um, you know, we could put over here the number of years on either side. Now, one thing we could say here is that there is 62 inclusive years. So that little I there, that means inclusive. So that also connects us to um, the 70 weeks, right? Just as a symbol, 31 and 31. Okay, and then we have um, from 70 AD to the Edict of Milan. So that's going to be what? Two, um, 253? Two, 243? What is the number? I'm trying to do two different things at once. Right, so 243 years. Just with the 62? Yeah, what's that? Uh, just with the uh, 62, 62 inclusive years from Actium oh. to the cross. Yeah. Yes, um, right. So this would be 39 years here. So I, I got to get the stoning of Stephen in here. So, um, right? Is that what you're saying? Or are you going to make a comment about the 62 years? So this, this is going to be... I'm going to make a comment about the 62. What's so that? Have, I was going to make a comment about the 62. Okay. So you, have, you also have Darius being 62 years old, being mentioned in Daniel chapter 5, I think verse 31. And uh, yeah. it goes back 508 years to when he was 62 years old in 539 yeah. with the fall of Babylon. Okay. And if you go forward from the cross, uh, 508, just three years, uh, that will take you to 538 right. and yeah. the beginning of 60. Okay. And uh, in 539, you had the tickle, tickle, mini, you're forcing you to 126 there. So that kind of like mirrors that. Mm -hmm. And then you can mark from 538 going back 62 years is uh, 476 with the fall of Rome. Okay. So, Rome. Yeah, so the fall of Rome in 476. How many years was that, you said? Uh, 62 years before 538. Okay. 476. Okay, so there, so there are things about this 62 that, that show up as a symbol. Um, dealing with Rome and Babylon and modern Babylon. So what is it about 62? Yeah, but the fall of, yeah, but something about the fall of Rome, the war the fall of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Connected. Yeah. And, and, and we know the 666 years connects Rome and Babylon and of course, papal Rome. I just wonder what this 62 means as a symbol. If there's something about it itself. Hmm. Okay, that's just me thinking too much. Now, it's just, you know, the, the center date of this structure, you know, is, is 133 AD. And 133, you know, symbolizes 313. I, I just don't know how, I don't know of anything that happens in 133 AD. Or is that right? No, it's not 133. Where's the center? Center of this structure. So we got, Never mind. Yeah. I did did my math wrong. So we take it's kind of an odd number. So one seventy one and a half is the center. I don't know what that means. You could probably use the actual number of days to get an exact date. Anyway, it it, it I don't think there's any real significance in the center date here. I, I think the center symbolically is the cross that that parallels this. Okay, so I know that's me just really starting to get a bit over analytical about it. Okay, um, so thanks for that, Stephen, with the 62. So when we start looking at this in, in this history, so this is going to be this history dealing with the league. So obviously it, it's mentioning the league because it's going to address the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the ultimate result. But this can be drawn on a line in some way. 
Now, between the league and 157, right? so yeah, or 158, pardon me, um, plus the destruction of Jerusalem, you're going to get um, 227 years between the two. If you added, you know, the 161, you'd get 230. So I don't, I don't know what, what we would do with that, how we would draw a line of that. I'd have to look at it in more detail. Okay. So anyway, the line above, we're satisfied with the general idea, right? So we're not, we're not drawing a bunch of detail here in this line. So when we look at the line before, and we're going to look at Augustus and Tiberius and Titus, um, what way marks would we put on there on the bottom? So we would go back to our analysis of this which is really incomplete, right? So one of the things we know about this is um, how we had analyzed the present truth application. We didn't get very far, right? So we still still don't have a solid understanding of this. So let's go back there. So we got we got these people in here, but we have all kinds of things that we haven't specifically addressed and we're saying that in this interpretation of this we're going to have tiberius that's going to bring us up to july 18th so what are we going to put as our way mark so we're going to say july 18th is the tiberius may way mark what about which is trump it happens in the time of trump so what about obama we know bush is julius caesar so what is it that we mark in Obama's history? Because we, we talked about this. What we say, Obama is Augustus. So we have Augustus, this raiser of taxes, right? And, and we weren't really sure what to do with that. So we have Augustus. Do we have something in the history of Obama that we, we would mark, right? Or is it is it wrong, right? So we discussed this back quite a while ago. It's easy to place July 18th in this line, but it's not so easy to place Augustus. Right. So when I go back to this diagram, you know, we can easily say, well, this is going to be July 18th. But how do we fit Augustus in between there? That is, how do we fit Obama? Because if we're making this 11-9, that there is this contrast between Julius Caesar and Christ, and we put it at 11.9, it has to have something to do with this movement. Or do we just leave that as 9.11, and that's Bush the second, it's just another 9.11, and put something else that's in the history of Obama. You understand what I'm saying? That That's how, how we looked at it. So we, we never decided any thoughts about it. Because if, if Augustus represents Obama, how is Obama represented in this history, are we mixing lines together? And we we had a big discussion too about really understanding Roman law and stuff. So anyway, if we if we took this and we made this 9/11 again, that's going to still be in the time of Bush, and and we would do what sort of what we did uh, before. You know, we talked about with this other line. Um, you know, we had spiritual formation over there, but then we put 11.9, and so we moved the Patriot Act and spiritual formation over just to the empowerment, and we put 11.9.19 there. So, but originally we had we had them as separate things, and would we put uh, spiritual formation? You know, he shall give him the daughter of women, right? Cleopatra. I don't know. So, I'm at a loss to. to to tell us what to do here. So somebody needs to have a suggestion. What should we do? Should that be 9-11 or 11-9 or both? Because I, I don't know what to do. I mean, is there any way that we can place Augustus as the second angel formalized as something that's connected with our immediate history if Augustus is Obama? Like, how does Obama affect our movement in, in any way? You know, if we're going to be looking at what we're doing. Now, one of the things that we have that we could address is Obama's inauguration. 
when he mugs them too. When he, I would agree with what William is asking because <clears throat> while Obama claimed to be Christian, he gave more obeisance to the Muslims than he did anyone else. Yeah, but what would that have to do with anything as far as what we're talking about in these lines? Well, it had to do with Islam, wouldn't it? I know, but but where's Islam here? On the second angel. That's all I'm saying. How would you put that there is all I'm trying to say. Just him being Muslim, I don't see how that has relevance unless you have some something behind that. In this kind of a situation, didn't he introduce many laws that became enforceable against Americans, but not against Muslims? Uh, I don't know. I don't didn't, he, didn't, he pass that, didn't he pass that health, um, <clears throat> that health light act, which would bring another tax on us? Yeah, well, that's the razor of taxes. That's the razor of taxes. But, but you know, we're addressing this line. This line has to do with with Rome, and Rome generally would symbolize the papacy in this history, and the United States being the armies of Rome. So, so we have you know we have the fall of the Soviet Union marking the first angel's message arriving. We have it as its formalization. Connected to the Battle of Thermopylae, we have the Siege of Jerusalem being 9-11 with the Patriot Act. And then we have to put Julius Caesar in Christ at something. It's either 9-11 or 11-9, 2019. And then, well, if Julius Caesar there is at 9-11, that's fine. We could put Obama in there somehow as a formalization of what's happened. So maybe it would be what happens after 9-11 and maybe Dwight's correct. I just don't know anything about Obama's history, what he passed or, or anything. Uh, but maybe there's a strengthening and, and it could be part in part a reaction to what happened with 9-11 being an Islamic attack. And then we end up with the president who definitely sympathizes with Islam, having that as part of his background. So if he passed laws that um, strengthened Islam. Well, the, the, the situation with this Affordable Health Care Act, which is also called Obamacare, yeah. is one where it is more of a tax upon Americans, especially working Americans, but if you are Islamic, you are not being required to adhere to this. And if I, if I'm recalling it correctly, um, there are those groups such as, um, many Catholic groups that are also not being required to have to adhere to this tax okay so I, I don't really understand any of that like what what exactly Obamacare was and how they could have some groups not having to adhere to what specifically so you have to explain more to me because I don't know anything about it I know the phrase Obamacare that's all I know okay every state in the United States has what is called an insurance commissioner who makes the decision as to what insurances are going to be allowed to be sold within their state borders. Mm -hmm. If I go 32 miles to my east, the insurances that are available in Idaho are very different from the insurance that's available in Washington. Yeah, so each state has their own regulation regarding health care and the health care insurance. Correct. Yeah, so it's each state individually. Obama, through his Affordable Health Care Act, picked up on what Hillary Clinton had wanted to do in the 1990s and what other groups had attempted to do many years before to have a 
a health care system that was going to be national in scope. Obama's health care system, as it is, was to be based upon the income of the person or upon the income of the family. Okay. Certain portions of this could be set aside depending upon your employment status or your religious beliefs. Okay. What, why the religious beliefs thing? I don't understand that. Like, what does that have to do with health care? In some, some situations, they would come back to say, we don't wish to adhere to every principle of this because this is how we believe. I'd have to I'd have to go back and give you some some details, but I do know that there are several groups that became very adamant about how they did not wish to comply with with any of the Obamacare regulations. Okay. Okay. Would that have any effect upon what happened during the pandemic? I don't know. I'm going to have to look at it. Okay. Because what I did here is I said, okay, if we're going to have Obama, maybe not his his reign being marked, because all of this is going to be in the time of Trump. But we see that represented in our movement are this, these conflicts that occur. So we got Parminder's movement that's representing, and, and maybe not necessarily Parminder's movement, but just within the movement, we have this contrast between the character of Christ and the character of Julius Caesar, right? And, and we would mark that at 11, 9, 19. And then if we're going to deal with health care, um, and I always mark March 27th, uh, 2020 as the start of this. Uh, for me personally, it was the start of the restrictions because of COVID, but it was also the date that the Seventh-day Adventist Church began the 100 Days of Prayer. And that ends up being placed, um, you know, as this uh, health care restrictions. And I just wonder, does Obama's Obamacare have anything, any bearing on what happened with those restrictions? Did that, did the fact that the, and from what I understand, I mean, the states actually had made the decisions independently on what they were going to do regarding um the health crisis, the the COVID crisis. Um, I don't know what part the the federal government in the U.S. had in that regard, but generally, don't they not? They don't have. At least they didn't. I mean, they shouldn't have anything to do with health care, right? That should be the state's uh, authority, right? So does that change with Obamacare that the federal government gets its uh, get some authority. Okay, the the major portion of the authority with healthcare, with this with this with Obamacare, mm-hmm. is that they're treating healthcare as being something you must basically you must register for. Now, I'm, to use an example, if if I have a vehicle and I seek to drive my vehicle in any of the 50 states, I have to have insurance on that vehicle. Okay. Or I must be insured to drive so that if I was to cause an accident, there would be a manner in which the there could be compensation to any of those that could be injured. Okay, so in the U.S., either the vehicle or the person Correct. has to be insured? So a, a person can be insured without the vehicle being insured? Correct. Okay. Yeah. In Canada, do you, you insure the vehicle, not the person? Yeah, they, that when, like when we came up for the, for the camp meeting, I carry a, a specific type of insurance. It's called a broad form because I use multiple vehicles in my work. Oh, okay. Broad form is not accepted in Canada. You have to have a 
specific vehicle insured. Yeah, that's how it is in Canada. Okay. Now, the situation with health care, the first attempts with a a wide-ranging health care system here was called Medicare. And Medicare was offered primarily to those that had reached retirement age. What Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, ACA, was attempting to make more health care available for more people. But under this law, if you did not sign up for health insurance, you would be fined. You would have a financial penalty. Now, mm-hmm. they started to look at the situation that health insurance was like vehicle insurance, that in order to live okay. in the United States, you had to have this health insurance. Otherwise, you had to pay money. Yeah, so if you want to live... You have to pay health insurance. Correct. Now, the problem that I have been having with this, especially under the laws in the state of Washington, as a male, I'd had an insurance agent look over the different health insurance that was available within the state of Washington. And for the longest time, my rates were dependent upon the cost of health insurance or health care for other women. So even though I was and ha- have always been a male, yeah. my health insurance premium was being based upon the fact that there were women that were likely going to need health care, specifically abortions, and that my rates were dependent upon paying for someone else's abortion. Okay. Now, some of the situation to help to pay for this Affordable Health Care Act has meant that there are new taxes that have had to be implemented to help to pay for it, specifically Mm -hmm. taxes on medical devices or pharmaceutical, pharmacaea sales. Taxes had also been increased for people with higher incomes. So the wealthy were being required to subsidize insurance for those that were not wealthy. Mm -hmm. So the other part of this is that many businesses were being told that you would have to automatically register your employees that receive certain hours or certain numbers of hours for the Affordable Care Act. So the businesses began to say, okay, we're just not going to offer this as many hours to these employees, period. So shouldn't they have called it the Unaffordable Care Act? Well, I I would agree, but the, the point is, they want to put it in what they see as being the best possible light. Well, I know in America, you guys pay way more for healthcare than we do in Canada, like astronomically more. Sure. And in Canada, it's just part of the taxes. Uh, part of your taxes go to, uh, like it's provincial, right? So right. Um, provincial taxes go to, uh, there'd be sales tax and things like that. And some income tax, they would go to just to the healthcare system and then everybody's got healthcare. You know, it's, it's not very expensive. Like, you know, a poor person doesn't really pay much. Now, most of our taxes in Alberta, of course, come because we don't have a sales tax in Alberta. We just have the federal sales tax and it just comes from oil revenue. So, there isn't really many people who pay Albert a tax at all other than, you know, the tax you get on your gasoline and then uh, the oil companies, what they pay. So anyway, it's, I guess all of that information regarding Obama, that's really where, where he's going to be this razor of taxes is about what happens with Obamacare. Right. Now the question is, does what, 
what he does bringing the federal government into health care because before that um it's it's really a state issue right that was part of the problems that people had with it well the states were regulating what could be sold what couldn't be sold at one point in the state of Washington, an individual could obtain health insurance for, be, say, between $100 to $150 a month, depending on what they need. There were certain tax, certain situations that could change that. What the Affordable Care Act was supposed to do was to help eliminate issues for people with pre-existing conditions to give them greater access to the healthcare markets. What it's, what's happened is the burden for some of these that may have cancer, that may have other pre-existing conditions has been spread over a wider group. Okay. Well, one of the things here that I'm reading is it says that during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that that was that created a rapid growth and expansion of enrollment in Obamacare. Okay. So I'm just trying to understand this graph here. So, yeah, so people enroll, enrolled for Obamacare because of the pandemic. So maybe that's something that it has to do with. Yeah. So, I mean, some people are saying, you know, it was – the Affordable Care Act actually helped people during the pandemic. Just looking at these headlines. But I, I thought at one time that the Supreme Court had um had uh ruled it unconstitutional. I there didn't even know, I didn't know we had it back in the force. The <clears throat> the Supreme Court did strike down elements of the what is called the Affordable Care Act, but they did not strike down the whole thing. So what what kind of, was it about um, choices people had or something? Primarily, it was the penalties that were were done away with. Okay. Okay, so penalties. So anyway, just looking at the line we have in front of us. um, So I'm just marking March 27th, 2020 as the pandemic itself. And that that would be where Obama's tax comes into play during the pandemic. But I don't know enough about it. It it is a health issue, but I don't know if we could just place that there. Right. So so this is one option. We could do this type of thing here or we could just, you know, go from 9-11 to Obama to to these histories. So we can have Bush, Obama, Tiberius. Titus. So I could get rid of all this. I'm just gonna put this down here for now. So so if we put 9/11 up here, so you're gonna have the Patriot Act, and now we're marking um, now we're marking Pompey there at 9/11, and then we're gonna mark here. We'll just put simply Bush the second, and then we would we would put something about Obama. Now. We had looked at, at this before, that there was a period of time between, so with Obama, we have his inauguration. So this is going to be, what we'll put it, one, 20, what year is it? One, the 20, and what year is Obama's? From 2008 to 2016. Yeah, so his inauguration's in 2009. Now, we had something addressing that. Um, as far as a symbol in our history. Okay, so there's 2,688 days from 9-11 to Obama's inauguration on January 20th, 2009. And that number is related to the tax, right? Right. Uh, uh, Additional extension, uh, an application for an additional extension of time to file your taxes. So, so that would make sense to put that there, right? Correct. Okay. 
So we got Obama, his inauguration, that 2,688 days. That's interesting. Okay. Now then we have Trump. So, you know, to what to mark in Trump's history? I mean, obviously we could put, um, you know, the election when he becomes president, uh, November 9th, uh, 2016. But normally we're going to look at in Tiberius, it's going to be, you know, about the crucifixion. So normally I would just put July 18, 2020 there. Okay. That makes sense. What I'm saying. I see it. Okay. And, and, and the question is, you know, this second angel's message, what is it? So we have the first angel's message. So in our history, you know, that was about like the line above is about Rome. Right now we're looking at our history. We're paralleling Rome and or at least this history is, is paralleling Rome in some way. So this is Rome in the sense of the papacy conquering the United States. Now, when it comes to to Bush the second and Obama, we can clearly see uh, that sort of thing happening. Right. Even though Obama's not, a, you know, a Catholic or anything like that, there still is a connection between his actions and what the Catholic Church is seeking to do to bring in a Sunday law, right? So things are put into into place, and so uh, in this control. What's that? I says, didn't the Pope visit uh, a capital under, uh, or was it under Obama or under Trump? The first time he visited, the Pope came to the uh, capital. Okay, so what you're talking about is um, um, it's going to be under Obama, or not? Where where the Pope is going to? Yeah, what does he do at that time? He goes to the White House. That was in 2015 under Obama. Yeah. Okay. I remember it was in 2015, and and it's going to be. Uh, uh, the Pope we have now, Pope Francis. Um, so what does he do? So um, kind of interesting that it was on September 22nd, 2015 as well. Yeah. Oh. Oh. And September 22nd, the significance is? I know we had something to do with September 22nd in one of our lines, but I can't remember. Right. Well, I'm as I'm looking at this, in our line, in, in in the Gregorian sense, this would only be the eighth day of the sixth month. But according to the rabbinic calendar, we would be on the ninth day of the seventh month. Okay, so let me see what you're talking about. Yes, yeah, so it's the eighth day of the sixth month. On the Julian, it's the ninth day of the ninth month, 22nd day of the ninth month. Anyway, it's in, in, interesting. Um, I know there was something else about September 22nd, which I can't remember. I know we're moving pretty slow here today, but anyway, I, I don't remember. I know there was some line or something that we had that had that date, but I can't remember what it was. Okay, so we got um, Obama. We got this 2,688 days, so that tax form number is appropriate. For Obama being the one who is responsible for the taxes. So I think that this line makes more sense to do it in this way rather than to put it the more detail into our history. So then we're going to have Trump. So we got Bush the second, we have Obama, we have Trump, and then we have to figure out what date is significant in relationship to Tiberius. Now here it's going to talk about Tiberius, it's not going to talk about the crucifixion, you know, um, as the main idea, right? So when it gets to Tiberius, we're going to have, um, so in, in verse 21, it's going to be how he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. And then it has, with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the Prince of the Covenant. So it's going to refer to, to the cross under Trump, right? So, so with, so what we would have to figure out is what is important here 
Is it about Trump obtaining the kingdom or is it, it is that the date we're going to mark? So that would be like November 9th, 2016. Right. So if we did that. But if we if we were marking November 9th, 2016, that's still under Obama. Yeah, but we're just marking when he wins the election. Well, so he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. It's about him obtaining the kingdom. So I understand what you're saying in the really technical sense. Until the inauguration, he's not the president. But this is not about him being the president. It's about him obtaining the kingdom by flatteries. And that would be the winning of the election. Okay, now I'm I'm not here to argue. Yeah. Can't we say that Biden also obtained the kingdom by flatteries? Well, maybe, but Biden's not part of this line here, right? This, this, that verse is, is addressing Trump. So Trump does this. So he's the one there. So we're going to have to think about this a little bit more. I'm just putting this here as, you know, what is it that we're going to mark as the second angel being empowered? And, and, to fully understand this line, how we're applying what's above to what's happened in our history. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the study that we have had here this morning. We just ask for your continued help as we try to understand these things. Uh, be with each person. May your angels watch over us and our loved ones. And uh, we entrust everyone to your care. Help us to do the things that we can to influence others for good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.